Hello and welcome at Seagraf Asia and especially to this talk. My name is Moritz Schwind, I'm part of Intagma, and today's topic is going to be the art, science and bandology of using algorithms for procedural design. So welcome to the art, science and bandology of using algorithms in generative design. But first our usual disclaimer to keep in mind, survivorship bias is real. So anything that might have worked for us or appears to might have worked for us might not work for you. So take anything in that presentation with a grain of salt and adapt what fits your needs. Before we start, let me briefly introduce myself and who we are and what we do. And I say we because I'm not alone in this thing together. And this thing is in Tagma. And as you might have guessed by now, I am not this man. This is my partner in crime, Manuel Casasola Makla, former creative technical director and founder of Munich studio Ike Sponsor. And by now, a professor for computer generated images at Nuremberg Tech. I am this man. My name is Moritz Schwindt, technical director, art director, based out of Munich, Germany. And I used to work together with Manuel Edda Sponsor before we started Entagma. And Entagma is a tutorial platform for generative design using mainly side effects Houdini. And we publish a free tutorial on a bi-weekly basis and premium content on what we try to become a weekly basis. And also we do a podcast format called Nerd Rant. You can access all of our contents on entagma.com, free, premium and nerd rants. And also if you want to support us, we are on Patreon. So why did we decide making Houdini our main tool or our main focus? What makes Houdini so special? And I brought you a few arguments that in my opinion speak for Houdini as a tool of choice. And those three points are, it is fully procedural. That means not only will you be able to change and adapt your setups at any given time or at any given point in the project, but also by just changing a few parameters in a given setup, you might be able to create totally new designs, which is very important when it comes to working with clients in advertising and commercials, such as we did where deadlines are extremely tight and you often have to generate variations of a design within an extremely short time frame. Then Houdini brings with it powerful tools. That means on the one hand, on a low level, allowing you to build setups and operations from the basic building blocks, but also on a high level as side effects Houdini's developers provide you with high level tools for simulation, rendering, character animation, just to name a few. And last not least, Houdini is very open and hackable via multiple scripting interfaces, node-based programming, and the ability to use Python 3 and its libraries. And that, in my opinion, is a rare combination to find in other 3D tools. So open and hackable, in which sense? Well, I think it's time to get a bit in that Houdini mindset and think about how Houdini handles geometry and data and what working with data means inside of Houdini. So inside of Houdini, data is attached to geometry. What does that mean? Let's have a look at this sphere. And typically in computer sciences, a sphere would be represented not as a perfectly round sphere, but by approximating it with a bunch of points that we space uniformly apart on a surface and then connect those points together to form this sphere. And if we do this finely enough at a high enough resolution, we get the appearance of a perfect sphere. What Houdini allows us to do now is to every instance of this sphere's mesh, that means its points, to its connecting edges and to its polygons, attach data. As for example, in this case, where we're attaching color data to the points. And now we can interpolate this color data along the edges, which results in this colorized mesh. Nothing special so far that can be done in most other 3D apps. Where it finally gets interesting is Houdini allows you not only to store color data on those individual points, but for example, data that configures individual springs where those edges have been. And now I can use this data to plug it into a physics simulation and get out a soft body simulation of that sphere bouncing around if I apply forces to it. Or I could use the mesh points to specify locations, for example, of airports and store connectivity information on those points as well. So which airports are connected to which airports and then use that to visualize flight routes on a global scale. Now, what do I mean with hacking it together and Houdini is hackable? Well, side effects designed Houdini in a way that it is an IDE for 3D animation. That means an integrated development environment in which you don't have to rely on pre-built functionality or built-in nodes, but you can script or visually program together even very unconventional setups. And often we take the inspiration for these rather unconventional setups from areas outside of computer graphics. And I want to give you three examples. Let's start with this one, the Sagrada Familia. And this here is the model that Antonio Gaudí used to figure out the load distribution and structure of the cathedral. He did so by spanning quite a few wires and weighing them down with those bags with weights, resulting in an upside down model of the cathedral and letting physics figure out the optimal geometry of the structure of that cathedral so it's statically sound. A very similar technique was embraced in the 60s by Frei Otto, a German engineer who focused on self-organizing systems. And he was tasked figuring out the structure and construction of Munich's Olympia Park, the stadium and facilities for the Munich Olympics in 1972, which have those tent-like structures made out of plexiglass that span above the venue. So here's a behind the scenes image of how that's been done in a rather similar fashion to Gaudi's Sagrada Familia, just using steel wires, weights, and in this case, a bunch of really nice 60s medium format cameras 
to document the resulting structure. And all of this behaves and looks very similar to what's called a minimal surface. For example, the behavior we can see in soap films spanning between individual structures, or in very stretchy fabric, such as in this example, or a bit more complicated in that one here. So how do we go about it when we want to build this virtually? Let's talk a bit about DIY soap films using cloth simulation. In this case, let's start out with a 2D example, makes it a bit easier to understand. And let's assume this is a cross section of a surface and it is fixed at these orange points here, at the outer points. As mentioned in computer graphics, there is no such thing as a continuous surface. So we discretize that by uniformly distributing points along that surface and then connecting those linearly. And again, now I can use Houdini, attach a bit of data to those points to make those points behave as springs pulling together like stretched rubber lines. And step by step, we can simulate and update the position of those individual points connecting those lines. And step by step, we will converge to a solution, which in our case will look like this. Very unspectacular in a 2D case, but that's exactly what a 2D soap film should do. And of course, we can do the same thing in 3D using, for example, this initial configuration where this outer tube here is pinned, the boundary, and this mountainous inner surface should behave as it were a soap film. And we do the same thing as with a line, configure all those individual connecting edges on the inside as springs, trying to pull the points towards each other. And then after we run this for a few simulation steps, we arrive at this, which already looks very much like a soap film to me. And of course we can do this with a bit more complex geometry as well, add a bit of nice soap film shading and a bit of wobble to make it look less static. And we arrive at this really intriguing and abstract animation. But what if I told you that there's another technique to calculate those minimal surfaces? And that technique relies on solving what's called the Laplace equation, named after a French mathematician of the 18th and 19th century, Pierre-Simon Laplace. And the canonical example that you find of that equation deals with heat flow. So this example image, which I pulled off the internet, shows the heat distribution in a metal plate that's been heated on the top edge, which can be calculated using Laplace's equation. In our case, however, we want to use it to build a minimal surface. So how do we go about that? Well, here's how it works. Let's think of this as our initial configuration, which we want to turn into our minimal surface. And let's think of this as mountainous terrain. And it's very foggy and we want to reach the peak, but we cannot see far. So what's our best strategy to finding a way towards a peak? Well, let's assume you are at this point and you can only look towards the next point and not further. What you do is you look at all your neighboring points here, just in your vicinity, and look in which direction you have to go to walk the steepest ascent. And this direction of the steepest ascent, which I visualized here, is called the gradient. It's the first derivative of our function. In this case, the first derivative of our altitude along the y-axis. And as you can see, those arrows, those vectors, they point neatly towards the peaks in this mountainous terrain. And in those valleys, they point away from the valley. So in these areas, the arrows of our gradient point roughly in the same direction. That's just one side of a hill. So the direction in which you have to go to get to the peak doesn't change much from one point to the next. In these areas, the arrows point towards a certain point. That's the peak. So at the peak, the direction of the arrows changes quite drastically around the peak as all those arrows point towards it. On the other hand, in these areas, in the valleys, the arrows point away from a certain point. So if we now calculate and visualize how similar our arrows directions are locally, that means around a given point, we get this image. And this is called the divergence. So in the valleys, you can see the divergence is negative where arrows are pointing outwards from a point while on the hillsides, such as here or here, the divergence is almost zero because all surrounding arrows point roughly in the same direction and the divergence at the peaks here is positive and very strong as all the surrounding arrows for one point point towards that point. So in this case, we first calculated the gradient and then the divergence of the gradient. And the divergence of the gradient is the second derivative of our original formula. Why do we care about all of that? Well, Laplace's equation specifies that inside of our boundaries, the divergence should be zero. That means the gradient of our function should not point to or away from any given point. And consequentially, our function within the boundary should not have any peaks or valleys. So let's try and calculate that by fixing our edges, which are called boundaries, shown here in yellow. And for each point inside of the boundary, set its point value to the average of its neighboring points values. And do this over and over and over again, a few hundred to a few thousand iterations. And then we arrive at this, which is this look that you could compare to a rubber sheet or maybe a soap film as well. And let's check if our condition of the divergence of the gradients being zero has been enforced. So this is the gradient and this is its divergence. And apart from those areas at the boundary, we were quite successful at minimizing 
the divergence here, as you can see by most arrows being in the reddish scheme that is around zero. Here's a clearer example that is exactly visualizing that heat distribution within a plane just plotted along the y-axis. And summing up, you could say that Laplace's equation makes the area inside the boundary vary as smoothly as possible. And in Houdini 19, we finally have a very easy to use Poisson solver, which can be used to solve Laplace's equation as well, which I did here and created the sculpture of this minimal glass surfaces spanning between those metal wires forming those docks. Also, Laplace's equation could be modified into what's called the Poisson equation, where we can drive how the value of adjacent points within our boundary varies, and thus drive the distribution of our values a bit more precise and a bit better, but that's a topic for another talk or another tutorial. The second algorithm that I want to go over or present to you, which I find very inspiring, has something to do with diffusion. And you might have heard diffusion in the context of reaction diffusion, which can be used to form these images as in the background. However, it's not only useful for that, but it can also be useful for this one here, creating procedural generative snowflakes, a simulation of a snowflake growing. And luckily for those kind of setups, we find papers and implement those. So this one is based on a paper by Clifford A. Reiter called a local cellular model for snow crystal growth. Here's how it works. We are working on a hexagonal grid because water crystals, that means ice, they form in this hexagonal configuration. And in that grid, we fill these cells with a background value, which you could think of as water vapor being available. And you notice there's this one cell in the center, which has not been treated yet. And this is where our ice crystal seed will be. And we consequentially initialize that with a high value of one or above one. And a value of one or higher indicates that this is ice. So what we do now for each simulation step is we split our grid, our hexagonal grid into two streams, non-receptive and receptive cells. And receptive cells are cells that are already ice or its boundary cells drawn in orange here. So for the non-receptive side, that means for the water vapor side, we just punch a hole in that virtual water vapor where the ice and its boundary has been and fill those cells with zeros. And then is where diffusion comes in handy. We just average out its cell with its neighbors, according to those weights displayed here in green and blue, resulting in this here, which just means that water vapor diffuses into those areas where the ice has been or where the ice's boundary group has been. As for the receptive group, that means the group with the ice crystal and its boundary, we just take those cells and to it add a constant, indicating that this cools further down and thus crystallizes out to ice. And then we merge both the receptive and non-receptive cells by just adding them together. So what we're modeling is the diffusion of water vapor into cooling ice. And again, this is the resulting simulation, which can be driven by varying not only the background values, that means the distribution of water vapor, but also the weights of the diffusion and how much ice, that means how much freezing occurs by dialing in how much to add to our receptive cells each simulation step. And I find this setup to be extremely satisfying because it's a very, very simple algorithm being able to simulate a wide variety of looks of different snowflakes and different cellular behaviors just by dialing in two or three parameters. The final algorithm that I brought you is a big one, which sent me on a two week journey and down in quite a few rabbit holes. And it all started out with a video, a video of this guy, Greek artist Petros Relis, who has this hoop with a bunch of hooks and takes a string and spans it between those individual hooks. And he continues forever and ever. And finally, he arrives at this image here, which I found quite fascinating. And I was asking myself, what's going on here? And luckily, I wasn't the only one. And the seventh comment below the video was by this guy, apparently a Vimeo staffer, who speculated that the algorithm is something like a radon transform. So I was asking myself, what, what is all this radon transform, this yarn out? So let me tell you a story about yarn, but also a story about the Beatles and a story about this guy's machine. So it's the 60s and these guys are selling records like crazy. Records like this one, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the best-selling album of the decade, not the year, the decade. And apart from this beautiful cover artwork, the backside of the record is interesting too. This is the Beatles publisher, EMI, and together with the Beatles, EMI got rich. But EMI employed other people and musicians too, people like Godfrey Hounsfield, an engineer who worked on radar in World War II. And recently, that means in the 60s, he built this, the Emmy deck, the first commercially available transistorized computer. This is one of the few images of it in use that I could find. And contrary to what it portrays here, people actually loved it. It was a huge success. So EMI asked Hounsfield, what would you like to build next? Which is fantastic if you're an engineer, just choosing your own project. So story has it, Hounsfield went on a walk and asked himself, what if I turn radar around? And what does he mean by that? Let me give you an example. This is a box and we have questions about its contents. Basically, we wanna know what's inside the box. And Hounsfield knew radar. He worked on it during World War II and radar works a bit like this. So from an airplane, you're sending radio waves out to sense the outside, the surrounding of the area. 
And Hounsville asked himself, what if we turn radar around and try sensing something on the inside of our imaginary box? Is there any way to reconstruct an image, 2D or even better 3D, of what is inside? Turns out there are better rays than radar when it comes to looking on the inside. So let me give you a quick X-ray 101. Here's how an X-ray imaging works. In theory, you have an X-ray source sending out X-rays going through a test sample and being projected onto what's typically been a film plate. And this flat projection can be problematic. Features can overlap and become difficult to discern from each other. But what if we try to slice our test sample and just image a single stripe out of it? Well, you might think that this is even worse. How can we create a 2D or even better a 3D image out of a single strip of x-rays? It turns out we can't. But if we rotate our sample and take multiple stripes, we suddenly can. And the final hack here is to install an electronic x-ray detector and not use film anymore. But the problem is detectors are expensive and even more so in the 60s. So our final hack is just to buy one single detector and move it in parallel with our source, which has the nice side effect that our rays are now in parallel too. And this makes our math a bit easier. And while Hounsfield pondered this idea a few years before that, South African born American physicist Alan M. Cormack had an idea too. And he asked himself, is there a way of reconstructing an image out of slices through a biological sample? And he published his theory and the math behind it in a physics journal. And back then you could kind of guesstimate the success or the popularity of your article by the amount of physical postcards you got asking for a reprint of your paper. Cormac received two postcards. It wasn't very popular. But he also built a prototype that could retrieve an image of several metal disks embedded in this plastic rotating container here in the middle with a radiation source and detector on either side. And Cormac even went so far to offer his idea to radiologists and ask them um, if this wouldn't be helpful for their work. Back then they were working on positron emission imaging. And of course, no one was really interested. Most people didn't bother or found the idea plainly impractical. And also Cormac later discovered that his math had been around quite some time and discovered by Johan Radon in a paper in 1917. It must have been pretty frustrating for him. But he kept up his good spirits, claiming later that my normal teaching and research kept me busy enough so I thought very little about the subject until the early 70s. The early 70s is when Hounsfield builds and commercializes his first prototype, which is shown here. And by now you might have realized that it's not boxes and their contents we're interested in, it's people. So this is the clear image of the first prototype showing the radiation source and a detector on that gantry, which is movable linearly and the sample, which is able to rotate. And in this case, the sample is a brain. And of course, you guessed it by now, Hounsfield built the very first CAT scanner, computer tomography. And as it's very uncomfortable for people to being rotated, commercial machines rotate the source and sensor around the patient rather than the patient inside the source and sensor. This is a video of the very first commercial machine, the ME Mark I, performing a scan on a patient. And you can see down there the source or detector moving in parallel while the whole assembly is rotated on that gantry around the patient. Not a very fast procedure. This is the first clinical image acquired using that prototype. I think it has a resolution something around 80 by 80 pixels. And doctors were thrilled because of this. That's not good news for the patient. That's a cyst in the brain. However, they were thrilled that they could find these cysts, for example, or any other abnormalities in a human brain without having to cut open people, which is a huge step in diagnostics. Over the years, computer tomography developed. Acquisition times have gone way down. The most common configuration that we have in use today is this fan beam set up here from 1976 with acquisition times now way under a second. For example, this is a rather recent scan of a 2018 Canon scanner having a resolution of 2K by 2K and being acquired in way under a second. This is how more modern machines nowadays look once they're opened, showing the radiation source, the x-ray source, and the detectors on the opposing side. And you can see this nice fan geometry really nicely here. And this whole assembly rotates around the patient who's lying inside there with this video showing an opened modern CAT scanner spinning up to full speed, which I clocked in around four or five rotations per second, allowing for an acquisition of four to five images per second, which is really fast. And this rotating stuff here is the noise that you hear when you're lying in one of those CT scanners. In contrast to MRT scanning noises, where you can hear the whole machine deflecting under the magnetic fields. While this paid out, here is Hounsfield among the other 1979 Nobel Prize winners, where he, as well as Alan Cormack, received the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine. So what's got all this to do with yarn art, you might ask yourself. Well, yarns are nothing more than x-rays in this case, just forming an image, just in reverse. So how do we go about reconstructing the image out of that? Let's start off with a very, very coarse sample. This is our sample and we're going to scan it just using two readings for now, resulting in these two lines. So we have this, how do we reconstruct that image? 
Well, let's just take them and naively blur them out and add them together, resulting in an image like this. And it's not exactly accurate, but also you can see, you get a rough idea of where higher densities and lower densities in our image are. So let's just continue this with more readings like 4, 8, 16 or 32. And with 32 readings, it actually looks quite decent. However, there's this thing, that nasty halo that's making our images difficult to read here. It looks super blurred. So to counter this, what we do is we have to sharpen the image before we smear it out and add it together. And there are a bunch of techniques such as unsharp masks, FFT based techniques, kernels, but what they all have in common is we take each of our line readings and add to them a bit of edge detection, a bit more contrast, which results in those lines being blurred out together looking like this, which doesn't exactly look brilliant, but let's just continue as previously and just add more readings. And you can see with 16 and finally 128 readings, the image looks quite decent, especially when compared to the unfiltered version. And this whole algorithm is called filtered back projection because we are projecting back those individual slice readings to form an image. And before we do that, we filter them. So they have a bit more contrast and a bit more edges in order to get rid of this nasty halo effect. And this is one of the main reconstruction algorithms in computer tomography. Let's go back to our yarn and create the artwork. So in order to create this yarn artwork, what we have to do is first inside of that yellow orange ring, we have an image and we sample it by shooting virtual rays through it and accumulating all the brightness values, which our rays intersect. And then we filter those values again to get rid of those halos and give those values a bit more contrast. So how do you turn those brightness values that we have here into yarns? Think about it. We have a bright background and want to span black yarns where our image is dark. That means in those dark stripe readings here, we want to have a high yarn probability. So for our yarn probability, we just have to invert that image. So now in the dark areas, we have a really high probability for a yarn to be spanned versus in the formerly very bright areas, there's now a very low probability of a yarn appearing. And then we just roll the dice. And for each of our values down here in a stripe reading, just randomly generate a value and check against our probability. If the value we generated is below this probability value, and if it is, we span a yarn. And then we just rotate the whole thing, do the same thing again, scanning the image, filtering it, inverting it to get the yarn probability and rolling the dice and spanning yarns again. And if we do this over and over again, we get to this, this or this, our own virtual yarn art. Here's just a brief look into the setup. I don't want to go into details. This is just the output the setup generates before being truncated. And there are multiple variables which you can dial in here. You can dial in the sharpening, the filtering. You can dial in the number of points that you want to have, filter, radii, yarn probabilities, yarn density, etc., etc. But once you constrain the edges of those rays of those lines to a circle, we get our yarn image formed. And I'm not sure about you, but I think that's pretty cool. And I personally don't know any other 3D app that could pull this kind of setup off. But that escalated quickly as well. So how do you learn all this stuff? And the honest answer to this is just through lots of frustration, lots of biting through it, lots of working on your own setups and trying to make them work. But there might be a few sources which might help you. On the more abstract, more meta level, there are a few books which I can recommend. And the most current ones that I've read and that I can highly recommend when it comes to computer science, math, papers or programming are Stephen Strogatz's Infinite Powers, which is the history and story of calculus. Really well written, really interesting book. And the other one is Deep Learning, A Visual Approach by Andrew Glasner. So if you're into deep learning currently, I think Glasner does a brilliant job of explaining that. And also Glasner's website is a treasure trove of information. So check that out too. But apart from books, there are more focused learning resources online. For example, for Houdini, sideeffects.com, the developers of Houdini have a really well curated learning library, offering learning paths, tutorials, talks, everything, just a huge library. So I can highly recommend checking that out. And more generally, when it comes to math, programming, physics, there's a fantastic three blue, one brown, which you definitely know, YouTube channel focusing on math, really well explained, fantastically visualized, absolutely loving this channel. Then there's the amazing Keenan Crane, whose work focuses a bit more on geometry, geometry processing, discrete differential geometry. And not only does he a really brilliant job in visualizing his papers and his lectures, he also made quite a bunch of his lectures accessible after COVID hit, so everyone can now benefit from his brilliant teaching. A bit more beginner friendly is the coding train. So if you're a newbie to programming to scripting and like a quirky instructor, I can highly recommend this one run by Daniel Schiffman. And he's using processing and P5.js, which isn't exactly the scripting language that's been used in Houdini, but is close enough as it's a C style language, such as Houdini's VEX scripting language. 
On the comp sci side, there's reducible, which I think is becoming a bit like the three blue, one brown for computer sciences. Also really well visualized, neatly explained topics from comp sci. Furthermore, there's Sébastien Lag covering a multitude of highly interesting topics in computer sciences. And finally, when it comes to papers, there are a few resources, such as Kissen Wang's homepage, collecting papers from the major computer science conferences all over the world. But most of the times I found papers alone being a bit hard to understand, a bit hard to read. And I had more success by following a few courses, for example, SIGGRAPH courses on certain topics, which are a bit more elaborate and take a more step-by-step -step approach to communicating certain findings or certain techniques. And then for more biology inspired papers, there's the great algorithmic botany side, collecting a bunch of highly intriguing papers covering natural and botanic phenomena. We're almost there. Just want to present to you two more gems. One is Matt Ferrero's blog, an aerospace engineer writing on topics ranging from CNC machines to designing your own caustic windows. And he does such an amazing job at explaining math and the principles behind it. It is just a sheer pleasure to read his articles. And finally, there is yours truly and tagma.com. If you want your quick fix of the theory and implementation behind procedural non-standard setups, mainly inside of Exudini, come visit us. Or if you just want to hear a nerd rant, come visit us over at entagma.com. And with that, all that's left to say for me is thanks so much for attending. Thanks so much to SideFX for having me. Hope to get in touch online or potentially in real life when this pandemic blows over. And I wish you good luck and all the best here at SIGGRAPH Asia and for the future.